Hello, everybody. Nice that you're here tonight. This panel is with Kim Albrecht, Albert Laszlo Barabashi, Wendy Chun, and Matthew Ritchie. So this discussion between scientists and artists will be a critical approach towards an issue that concerns all, all of us, big data, and the way we reflect on it and how it's being produced, used, visualized, and how data affects the ordinary life. So I would like to introduce the panelists quickly to you. So um, Kim Albrecht visualizes cultural, technological, and scientific forms of knowledge. His diagrams reveal and question structures of representation and explore the aesthetics of technology and society. Albrecht is a senior researcher at MetaLab at Harvard and was until recently, I would say, a PhD candidate in media theory at the University of Potsdam. There's much more to say, but now I switch to Albert Laszlo Barabashi. So he is a phys physicist and the founder of the Barabashi Lab, which is specialized on high definition and highly interpretive visualizations um, of his research central to his work. He is also Robert um, Gray Dodge Professor of Network Science, a distinguished, distinguished university professor of physics and the director of the Center for Complex Network Research at Northeastern University. So examples of his visualizations have been shown at the Serpentine Gallery in London and at the Ludwig Museum in Budapest, among others. He has also written several pop popular books, amongst them The Formula from 2018, Bursts from 2010, and is the author of the award-winning textbooks Network Science and Fractal Concepts in Surface Growth. So, Wendy Chun. She is the Canada, Canada 150 Research Chair in New Media at Simon Fraser University and led the Digital Democracies Institute, which was launched in 2019. The Institute aims to integrate research in the humanities and data sciences to address questions to equality and social justice in order to combat the proliferation of online eco chambers, abusive language, discriminatory algorithms and mis- and disinformation by fostering critical and creative user practices and alternative paradigms for connection. So there's so much more to say, but I switch to Matthew Ritchie now. <laughs> so Matthew Ritchie, he's an artist in environmental uh, installations of paintings, wall drawings, light boxes, games, sculptures, films and performance works, and they are also continuous investigations of the idea of embodied information explored through a shared universe of interconnected stories and images that draw from art, architecture, science, fiction, fiction history, and the dynamics of culture, all unified by a unique shared visual language. So um, he, um, his work has been shown in numerous um, exhibitions and museums worldwide, including the Whitney Biennial, the Guggenheim Museum, the Museum of Modern Art, the ZKM Karlsruhe, <laughs> and numerous other institutions worldwide. Um, he's also the author of The Temptations of the Diagram and has written for Art Forum, Flash Art, and October, amongst other magazines. So um, thank you for listening to this very short bio. And <laughs> um, now I would like to um, start, first of all, to invite you all to give a short statement about your key motives working with data or the visualization of data. So I would say we do it alphabetically, starting with Kim Albrecht. Very nice that you're here. Hello, Kim. Hello, hello, everyone. Um, Teresa, thank you so much for leading this, first of all, um, and guiding us through the evening. Um, so I think when it comes to my personal motives, they have changed quite a lot over the last 10, 15 years. Um, when I was a student in graphic design in my bachelor's, I got interested in data. And I think it was like basically this new medium that came up, this new way of uh, looking at things. And this idea that we are at the beginning of recorded history, that there's something that suddenly um, things are um, recorded and that there, there is a new uh, kind of system in place that, uh, that is transporting the world into this digital realm. And we, we suddenly have this big 
massive sets of data about all kinds of things. And as a designer, it was a novel mode of working with things that um, became quite interesting and visualizing the systems, um, also learning to program was something uh, that very much inspired me and that became very interesting. But over the last, I would say five years now, um, my motive has switched a little bit and I'm not asking that much anymore. What can data do or what um, is data uh, supposed to do in the world or what is it representing? Um, but also uh, the negative implications of it, the, the, the side that is not, uh, what is it that a network cannot represent? What is it that a data structure cannot represent? What can't we basically put into this forms? And, and what is lost in this translation? So, and I think this interplay between making things with data and uh, with visualizations, but then at the same time, always questioning uh, what, what is left out of these pictures and what is not, what cannot be included. Um, so those are the things that, that very much interest me and uh, that I'm um, inspired by. Thanks. Wendy, would you like to go now? I can you hear Wendy? I cannot I hear you. You're still muted, Wendy. Uh, wait. Hello, everyone. Can you hear hey. me now? Excellent. Yeah, perfect. Sorry. So um, I just started by saying that I'm so excited to be here. Um, I've been following the work of the ZKM and the Berbazi Lab for some time now, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation. Um, I'm speaking to you from Boston, um, so I want to acknowledge that I'm on the territory of the Massachusetts and their neighbors, the Wampanoag and Nipmuc peoples. And I extend my respect to the citizens of these nations who live here today and to their ancestors who have lived here for over 500 generations. Um, I want to stress, of course, that this land acknowledgement um, is a very small gesture. Um, but in Canada, at least, it's part of a larger process of truth and reconciliation. A sometimes slow and faltering process of truth and reconciliation um, to face the violent truths of settler colonialism, um, such as the horrific residential school system. Um, so for almost 100 years, indigenous children from the age of six, um, these children were torn from their families and communities um, and basically interned within these schools and dormitories. Um, and in, in these schools and dormitories, they were under constant surveillance. Um, they were punished for speaking their own languages. Um, they were maltreated, malnourished, and experimented upon, um, all in the name of democracy and education. Uh, so for example, tuberculosis raged in these schools um, because the students were so malnourished um, and because they were living in such close quarters. Um, this was well known. Uh, so what did the school authorities do? Um, well, rather than providing more food, um, the nurses took their blood samples um, to help researchers understand the effects of malnutrition on tuberculosis and uh, the effects of malnutrition on child development. Um, so they treated these schools as an opportunity to gather data and to build models. Um, and not surprisingly, we keep finding unmarked graves of children, um, graves that survivors told us many, many years ago and over and over again um, that these graves were there. So what we're finding, what we're uncovering, this evidence um, has never been hidden. And this act of finding what's never been hidden, um, those others who ground discoveries and standards and who live on in our daily actions and habits, like the nutrition chart that Canadians now live by, um, are key to my motif, motifs 
for working with data. And I have to say, I saw motif rather than motive, so I'm offering you my key motifs for data. Um, and my key motifs are be curious, um, be careful, and be curious and be careful so we can be responsible. Um, be curious um, because data, what we're given, um, is always the beginning and never the end of the story. Um, be curious because data, data has always been more than numbers and measurements. Um, in fact, data stems from the Latin term denare, um, to give. And as Daniel Rosenberg has shown us in early scientific work, um, equations and relations are um, not simply measurements and numbers were data because they were things that were given. Um, and if you go back to the etymology, anecdote and data aren't opposites. They come together from the same word, donare. Um, datum is a thing that's given. Um, data most simply is a gift. Um, and we should always be very curious and very careful with gifts. Um, gifts, after all, are dangerous. Um, they're Trojan horses, they contain enemy soldiers, they contain viruses. Um, but gifts are only dangerous if we're not careful. Um, if we ignore how surfaces lie, if we don't care for the relations and histories and the worlds, um, all the gifts that are part of data. Um, and data is only dangerous, these gifts are only dangerous if we treat data as sources of information rather than care-filled, care-filled traces of potential companions. Um, so data for me, data always demand response. Um, we respond to gifts. It's in response that we face something like responsibility. So data are things to begin with. Data are things to create with. Um, data are beginnings of what Ariella Azulay has called potential history. Um, so my motifs, again, are be curious, be careful, so that we might be responsible. Thank you. Thank you so much. So um, maybe Matthew, it's your turn now. So this is a um, project that you were familiar with, uh, the Morning Line, which is outside the camp now. It's a data structure, although it might not seem to be one at first glance. It's a fractal. And my work is very much about the idea that um, information has somatic form. And speaking to Wendy's point, that that form has an enormously long history for which we are all already in some way responsible, um, both for investigating it and sort of keeping it alive, but also for understanding what it has yet to become. And whether it's a force for harm or good is a, is a very complicated question because all through human history, this is a project at the Getty Research Institute. We've been gathering data and making data forms and ways of seeing the universe and connecting them into systems of power and representation that have both launched humanity on the trajectory it's on today in the positive sense and in the negative sense. There is every form of diagram from very good diagrams to very evil diagrams. And they're all based on the gathering of data and it's assembly into a kind of iconic structure. So when I was looking at Arabashi's lab work, which I've, I've known for a while, my first encounter was this 2008 paper on cell phone use, which reminded me of Perrin's um, first drawing of how atoms walk through space, but also of the ancient myth of the Morai or the fates, who's uh, just to give the audience another Latin tag, um, their name means proof or ascertainment. So their original purpose and sort of was understood as a form of computational evaluation of a person's life and the value of that life. So in Hellenistic culture, you know, going back to the, the wonderful example of the Trojans, there was um, a, a strong sense that lives had specific monetary and cultural value. There's another thing I write about briefly in the catalog, which is another sort of myth. This is uh, 
and a paper, the second paper I encountered was the uh, relationship on a kind of physical level of information to the atomic structure of reality and how we could start to see things like the World Wide Web, which is pictured on the right, as a physically embodied structure of atoms themselves. I found this diagram absolutely compelling and, and have used it in several projects of mine. This is a recent publication on uh, history. Matthew, we, we are not seeing your slides. Uh, I don't are intending to share those. I do not know why that is not the case. So let's try that again. It says I'm sharing them. Now we see that. Excellent. Where your screen actually. Oh, well, um, I'll flip back a couple then, but not too much, if that's all right. That's perfect. <laughs> How about now? Do you see it? Now? Still see it? Yep. Okay, yep. good. Sorry about that. <laughs> the mysteries of Zoom. Um, so this was, I was referring to these images of, um, this is a, the Getty Project, the history of human diagrams, uh, showing these kind of sources of power. Uh, this is the images of the 2008 paper and the Paran atomic tracks and the, the fates working on the loom of fate, uh, which was understood as a computational space. Here's the image of the World Wide Web and your work on the uh, Bose-Einstein condensate network. And a recent project that I've just published, uh, it's an academic paper on the history of visualization systems. Uh, this, you get two of them, Albert. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see this kind of iconic form. I've used it in a number of projects. There it is at the Moody Center. You can see it on the, again, here on the screen. These are all representations of ways of seeing. And one of the ways of seeing that has Arabashi Lab has contributed to, I think they've contributed something new to how we see data, which is the, this sort of networked environment, visualization environment. And in another sort of convergence with Wendy's talk, here's um, the famous statue of Lao Kun, who was the priest who, who warned the Trojans about opening the horse for, with the gift inside it. And uh, I think there's a, it's a famously contested sculpture. Everyone's argued about whether it's good or bad or what it represents all through human history, this myth, what exactly data holds inside itself and what can be released from it safely and who's in charge of that process. So Lao Kun is murdered by the, the data gods of his day because there's a war over who's gonna control the secret. And he's the, the serpents or the kind of snakes come out of the ocean and kill him and, and his sons. Um, so thinking about the work of the Bharabashi Lab going forward and the connectome, I feel we're in a state of emergence where data and its forms are it's very much we don't know what's gonna happen next. We're just at the very, very beginning, going back to what Kim was saying. I grew up with a slide rule. I was the last generation of students who were raised on analog. There were no computers. You know, and now I live in a world where everything is mediated by computational space. So my current research is, um, I'm looking at using GANs to analyze art history, which really GANs are data sets of very kind of crude representations of pictures. So I'll just very quickly skip through some of these slides of like what we're doing, and we can go back to it later if it seems interesting, but really GANs are able to be dissected. And what I'm really interested in is like how they start to overlap, how theories of picture over time change, and whether there's a series of sort of catastrophic breaks, which is one version of art history, or whether it's really all one emergent data visualization system. And so we've been doing a lot of sort of a you know, animations and seeing how the data sets evolve over time to so, sort of see uh, what is really going on under the surface of an adversarial network. And it's a bit of a black box, even the people that wrote the programs call them a black box. So hopefully this will be a sort of productive space because once we get into black boxes, the world gets kind of more interesting for an artist. So we've had a lot of success sort of translating between visual regimes, um, moving from Babylonian symbols, like kind of early pictograms into more sophisticated drawing sets. And now we're um, trying to apply that to painted space, which has one advantage, which is it's sort of inherently ambiguous. And despite its long history of representing power systems and structural flaws, it's a plasmatic space. And so I think it has the potential to 
present itself as a new data space. And I sort of can't help but dream as an artist, like one day, this is what scientific graphs will look like. Like they'll sort of start to enter this kind of world um, and everything will start to become fluid and dynamic and the kinds of very specific graph-like spaces that we read will start to become legible as mobile data forms. So that's a sort of a, a fantasy that all artists have. Someday they'll enter the scientific discourse. So I'm very grateful to be here as part of this conversation and to sort of potentially provide something of interest to the rest of you. Thank you very much. That was very nice of an insight, super. Thank you so much. So um, right in the conversation, I would like to start with the first question, but before I'm doing that, uh, I just wanted to remind our audience that you can also ask questions in the YouTube chat. So please go for it. Um, I can um, see the questions and um, give them to our panelists. So we will answer, give answers to you in the end of the conversation. So um, this is a question um, I would say, um, having listened um, to your statements um, to Kim and Wendy. So um, Wendy, especially you are already researching for a long time on the usage, usage of data. And um, before studying big data and data design, you have also written an enormous body of work on the internet and digitalization. And of course, Kim is also studying data for many years already. So given all your knowledge about digital infrastructures and how they are changing our lives, how do you both reflect on our relationship with data? Please. <laughs> So let me start. Um, first of all, let me, uh, I'll take your comment that I am critical as a compliment. Um, it's like I always tell my students, um, being critical doesn't mean finding something wrong and then tearing something down. Rather, being critical means finding something that you care about um, and then exploring its limitations and possibilities. And I think that clearly right now, data is so important to us. Um, I unfortunately haven't managed to completely escape the dystopia that is the United States right now. Um, and clearly data and evidence-based reasoning is important. Um, and because it's so important, we need to be critical. Um, and again, explore its possibilities and limitations. And I think two things come immediately to mind when people talk about um, critical relationships to data. Um, one is discriminatory algorithms, um, and the second is um, surveillance and tracking. Um, and the primary example that people use for discriminatory, discriminatory algorithms is a US program called Compass. Um, and I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with Compass, but it's a program used by some U.S. courts to determine the risk of recidivism. So to de determine how likely someone is to commit another crime. Um, and it's actually been sued for um, being discriminatory against uh, racial minorities. And this is in part because although it doesn't use overt racial categories, it uses proxies um, for, I would say, not race, but racism within the United States, such as educational and employment status. Um, another problem that people have shown is that it uh, depends on dirty data. So incomplete police data or police data that's been focused on certain neighborhoods to the exclusion of others. So one problem is that uh, with these programs is what they take as their ground truth is fundamentally a deep fake. Um, and that, so what they reproduce as true is this deep fake past um, because they're validated on their ability to predict um, past values rather than um, future values, um, just basically in terms of training and validation. Um, so we have one phrase, or one problem of this sort of deep fake past um, becoming uh, the past and being repeated over and over again as the future. Um, and then the other problem that people usually talk about is surveillance. Um, surveillance capitalism, the ways in which um, we're constantly tracked and manipulated um, in order to act in certain ways. Um, and I don't know how many of you watched The Social Dilemma, which was this 
popular docudrama on Netflix, but it was all these um, sort of very repentant Silicon Valley dudes saying, you know, we did bad and, you know, look, um, all these users are marionettes um, that we are manipulating. Um, and I think what's important in both of these, if, especially if we think of these two together, and we have to think of these two together, is to understand the limitations of taking these models for truth and the gap that's opened up between um, truth and action through these models and how important this gap is. Um, so one reason, of course, why these models seem to close the future um, is because they rely heavily on correlation. Um, and correlation was actually produced by 20th century eugenicists um, in order to um, program a certain future in which the past and the present and the future were um, undisrupted. So this is the most undisruptive version of the future you have. Um, but I think what's so key for us is to, again, think through that gap as a space of political opportunity. And when I always think about these models and their uses and how we can relate to them and, and relate to them critically and productively, I always think of global climate change models. Um, so global climate change models give us the most likely future based on the past, not so that we'll accept that future, but rather so that we'll act in such a way to change it. Um, and when a model shows a 2% increase in temperature, mean temperature, we seek to fix the world, not the model. Um, and that arguably could be our responses to discriminatory programs like Compass, because what they arguably show us is the ways in which racism works, right? Compass was actually sold um, and brought, introduced during the Obama era as a way to get rid of discrimination because it was felt that discrimination was introduced through judges' individual biases. So they got rid of individual bias, but what that amplified was systemic bias. So it could be a way of diagnosing what's wrong. Um, and so I think that thinking through our relationship um, and, and always thinking through that productive gap between what we're given, um, what might happen and what is, is, is fundamental in understanding what a critical relationship to data will be. So Kim, would you like to jump in? Yeah, I think, I mean, this was already so fantastic and such a, a, such a broad view on the topic and so uh, drew so many connections. Mm. So for me, maybe a very personal note um, in the beginning, um, I had to spend a couple of days at the hospital this summer and every day a nurse came in and asked me to uh, rate uh, the pain that I have um, for, on a scale from one to 10. Um, and that happened on a daily basis. Um, and the entire procedure that was happening um, in the in this system uh, was based on data that they captured or that they that, that they somehow got out of me, um, and they then had a, a chart of uh, if I'm doing better or worse. And I mean, being in that room and um, getting that question every day, um, it became so obvious that there's no way to truthfully answer this question. I mean, there is just like um, rating a day on a scale from one to 10. This is an impossible thing. There's so much going on. I mean, there's so much experience that, uh, that I lived through throughout the 24, uh, 24 hours uh, per day um, that it, it makes it impossible to, uh, to put something onto a scale um, of that magnitude. And... So for me, it, it's not even about uh, if some algorithm is discriminating someone or if um, a prediction uh, might fail or if there are uh, specific problems with data, but I'm rather interested in other things that we cannot capture in data at all. What, are, what is happening in the world? How is the world functioning? that might not uh, be able to put into a CSV file, into a JSON file, into any of these formats that exists, and that then 
um, scientists, uh, but also business administrators, etc., work with. And especially in science, this is interesting because uh, like basically every kind of um, natural science at least became a data science. It's all like about um, going out, capturing something and making, uh, uh, turning that into, into a grid structure uh, that we can then look at and process further. And this uh, this is obviously working on a lot of scales, but I, I'm wondering if there are some scales that where this might fail or this is failing. And I think um, on my personal um, um, visit at the hospital, I would say that in that case it failed. So if I may, Teresa, and this is actually a very interesting conversation because we're having, you know, uh, I'm a scientist and I deal day by day with the limitations of data. And data is not new for us, right? I mean, in the way Newton discovered the laws of motions and gravitation actually based on data that Copernicus and Kepler have connected and interpreted, right? What has changed in the last kind of uh, 50 years is the ubiquity of data, the easy access to data, and it's all encompassing nature that it really kind of captures all aspects of life. With, and, and all of that data is inherently incomplete and biased. And one of the challenges we always have in the science lab is to kind of you know, how do you deconvolute those biases so the conclusions that you can, uh, you put out there is, uh, is kind of not biased and it stands the test of life, uh, time. But what is interesting, however, is, is that we live in the era where data, data deeply determines our life, right? What computer screen I'm looking at, uh, you know, how do I reach you? What water do I drink? Uh, just about everything is determined by some kind of data streams, by decision based on data streams. Uh, so what is interesting for me is that we live in a world where the surface is not representative any longer but it is what's under the surface that determines our life. And that's why I find Matthew's work actually so fascinating because he's trying to actually bring on the surface some of these data threats and some of these deep connections that are there underneath, but we're, we're, we're not kind of thinking about them. And we still think that we're living our life as we did 100 and 200 years ago and not realizing to what degree our data is determined by life, uh, by determining our life. So in one end, I would be curious whether Matthew and this panel in general is how much responsibility does art have, who historically has been a venue through which myths and uh, kind of the prevailing uh, uh, history was presented to humanity, right? That was its ear early purpose, right? From churches to monuments. Now, in the 21st century, where the surface is not representative any longer, the, the, the challenge is not any longer to do an accurate rendering of somebody's face whom we look up at, but somehow the challenge should be to really show the reality, which is not on the surface, but under, but on these multi-dimensional data streams. Uh, so how does how should art kind of connect to those to that conversation, which is so determining our life? Thanks for giving me a nice softball question. <laughs> um, well, it goes a bit back to what. Uh, I think there's kind of two strands. I just want to pick up on something Kim said, which is, you know, if you have that conversation, I just learned this in the United States, when they ask you how you're doing, they, they fill out a little piece of paper and that they charge you $188 for asking you the question of how you're doing. So it's both a data gathering exercise, but also the monetization of every single step of the clinical environment is driving the data. So the data is sort of being driven as a profit base at every single level, much the way Wendy was talking about. Like, and I think in that one sense that that kind of tithing is, has always been a cost of the idea of data. And that goes back to the Greek myths of sort of why they were obsessed with the idea of fate being a kind of physicalized as a loom that literally every knot in it detailed your, your life. And this question of, so one of the things that art can do is tell stories, but 
those stories aren't true. I mean, that's very important to, and so our kind of responsibility in both as artists and scientists, that's why I think this conversation is so interesting. And like, this is the first time that I think artists in a long time, we can talk about Renaissance perspective and like use of optics as a way artists suddenly had tools of a quasi science. You know, you see pictures of them with kind of perspectival frames pretending to be natural philosophers. This is a new moment like that where artists and scientists are plunged into a form of visualization that none of us have any experience in. So I'm not trying to shirk responsibility, but rather saying, I can see the emergence of information space and data structures as, a, as an emergent form of art. And so my responsibility is like to try and make sure that doesn't get, just get turned into kind of the Van Gogh immersive experience or something where it's monetized and turned into just a monetary, like what, what is beginning to worry me about the art world is with NFTs. NFTs are a form of making kind of quite bad art cheap. And therefore you can create a data set of who's buying NFTs. And it's really can become an algorithmic form of, of extracting money out of people for looking at art. And so it's gonna go down like lowest common denominator. I'm just as interested in what's the highest common denominator. And I would say that's a question of emergence. Mm -hmm. And that's a difficult, but what I've loved about the Barabashi's Labs research is it always seems to have this 7% or 10% unknown. And that's where I'm like, this is exciting. There is at least <laughs> seven to 10% where the algorithm consistently fails to even follow or track someone. And 7% that you see, and I don't want to say what percentage we see that we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I'd love to hear what Wendy thinks about that sort of indeterminate space because we rely on these historical records, but they themselves are narrated and belong to people ultimately. Yeah, where I think um, art is so important or and, and we can think of art broadly, um, this goes back to what Kim was saying in terms of what's not captured is that a lot of the logic behind data capture, especially um, if you look at a uh, uh, social media, etc. There's a fundamental behaviorist understanding of human beings, right? So the idea is to figure out triggers um, that will cause certain behaviors and to agitate us in such a way um, that we're more likely to follow certain triggers. Um, and it, you know, a lot of it is based on this bizarre notion that somehow if you take a lot of people who are the same and put them all together, they'll be comfortable. Um, and that similarity breeds connection, et cetera. Um, and if you take a lot of people who are similar and you cluster them together, what you get is very agitated repulsion as well. I always think of that the experiment where you have those two poles and then you have a whole bunch of similar people together um, repelling each other um, and depending on this negative other in order to, to, to stick together. Um, and I think that in order to get away from some of these behaviorist um, understandings, not because they don't work sometimes, is to actually question some of the fundamental presumptions like homophily. Um, so the idea that similarity breeds connection comes from studies of US residential segregation. Um, and what's important about these studies of US residential segregation, which ground the notion of homophily, that um, similarity breeds connection, is that they also found um, that, and they were looking at race here, and in particular, right, white residents' um, uh, attitudes to living in biracial housing. Um, and they said white liberals overselect each other and white illiberals overselect each other. Um, and that's the basis of homophily. Um, within that article, they also coined the term heterophily. And they also alluded to the fact that there were friendships across races um, and, across, and across gender. Um, that weren't captured within these clean concepts. So I think that what art does and what all of this sort of analysis does is sort of sit, not simply with the undecidable, but with what uh, we were referring to as the gaps. Because for me, what's the most fascinating thing about a network, and here I think the Barabowski Labs um, representations and visualizations are just uh, superb, is that for me, the network is always the gap. Um, 
And so for me, those gaps are always these vibrant spaces. This is where the, the um, answers of the black residents were so important because they're the gaps from which the notion of homophily or certain white forms of friendship could emerge. And within these gaps, there live these other stories and other representations. And I think thinking through and with them is so central. Um, and in terms of what you said about um, truth, I th what I find so interesting, because uh, so I was an engineer, and then I got a PhD in English literature. Um, and what's always fascinated me is that people read literature and they find it true. They find that it speaks to them in a way that something factual doesn't. And I wonder to what extent we need to think through that, that other form of truth or different forms of truth that can't be reduced to correctness, right? Because if you, and again, global climate change for me is the, the example of it, because if you believe that global climate change is true, you'll act in such a way that we'll never know if a given prediction is correct. And they make the difference between being correct and being true very clear. Um, and I think that this is also um, what art um, does and can do. But not all art, right, of course. <laughs> <laughs> I actually find it fascinating that you call the network the gaps. And, and you are actually factually true, because one of the big discovery of network science mm -hmm. is that most networks of interest for us are actually very sparse networks, right? I could have 7 billion friends in the world, but I have a few hundred or a few dozen at most, and the rest of them are unknown. So they're missing connections, right? Potential connections that are not there. And, uh, and in, in that sense, I'd be actually very curious about uh, Kim because Kim has been one of the very stellar designers in the Barabashi lab for two years or longer even, right? And you actually probably, the, the work that is right now in the ZKM is really the representation of gaps at the scale that cannot be bigger than that because it's, you're representing the universe and the voids and the connections in there. Well, what you described today actually is a transition from that type of representing the truth as we have it in the lab to more kind of questioning the validity of the data. And how is the transition happened for you? And, you know, like how, how did you kind of go from this kind of bringing alive the, the content that we believe is true, right, to, to kind of questioning the origins? Yeah, uh, thank you, Laszlo. So, so I'm not even sure if it was not already there when when I was at the at the lab. Um, mm -hmm. And I think this becomes I, I can share um, my screen so we can look at the visualizations because I, I think the visualizations are a very good document of uh, this kind of thinking. Um, so I hope you can see them. So. Okay. The, the interesting point for me about this project was, so, so what you see here, just um, to give, give an introduction, are uh, um, I think 200,000 um, uh, points, uh, which each of them represent uh, one galaxy. And uh, then um, the scientists uh, working with Laszlo calculated uh, and made uh, different uh, variations on connecting these clusters. There's this points of, um, of universes, of galaxies. And so, so what is like, maybe the, the first point that is interesting here is that um, all of this is a model. There's nothing, I mean, it was in the end, uh, there is observational data um, that uh, they correlated uh, this with, but this is calculated in a supercomputer, um, which is fed by algorithms, um, which uh, lets these points um, uh, uh, move around uh, until they find this position. Um, and then on top of that, are the different uh, network algorithms that um, we assembled in, in Laszlo's lab. And there are, the, the interesting thing for me is that this visualization uh, does not function on its own as one image, but there are multiple images of basically, and, and what we see here, the positions of the points, they do not move. Uh, but what is changing are the algorithms to calculate the network. Um, so this is a nearest neighbor algorithm, uh, so-called. 
um, this algorithm connects to, so, so nearest neighbor is that, that it looks like um, in a certain distance, like, like to, how many net, uh, to how many points can I connect? Um, here it connects to N different neighbors, so um, 10, 20, 100 neighbors. Um, and in this, the weight of the various um, galaxies is taken into account. But for me, the interesting fact is that um, the visualization, and I think this is true for a lot of projects that, that I've done in the lab, is that they basically reveal something that was happening within the science. So they, um, they give access uh, for the viewer into um, this perspectives that are normally chosen um, in our lab meetings. Uh, there, there, there was this point when, when there were different algorithms or different ways to compute something, and then um, one choice was made. Um, and I think uh, the visualizations have the power to, to some extent, democratize this and, and make it accessible, make through this uh, graphics accessible various versions um, that are happening within the scientific process. And I think there are quite a few um, projects uh, that were happening in the lab where, where this is this is true and where visualization can basically have this power to, to reveal something like that or to, to hint at something like that. Um, yeah. Yes, what, what is interesting, Kim, however, is that through these choices and through your visualizations, this is now our visual story about the cosmic web, right? It's here mm -hmm. behind me, right, in the light box. It's in Zika, I'm in the museum. And now, and, and in a way, you know, you have actually shaped our understanding of reality of how do we look at the universe as a network in the same way as Matthew's work actually in the museum, in the Getty and other places actually giving another narrative, both about mm -hmm. the universe as a problems that, the, so that's where I think we have an interesting responsibility uh, in the kind of at the interplay between the art and science and data space is that we make these choices, once these choices are finalized, you know, in a way that becomes our narrative and that becomes our reality. Yeah, but, but there's still, um, uh, to that extent, still, I mean, you, you have only one of them in the background, yes. <laughs> uh, but in the museum and also at the ZKM, they're shown together. So, yes. and this opens up, this broadens and, and gives access to, to various uh, possibilities that are out there and where we are not saying that the, the one thing is the truth or, or the other. Absolutely. A good compar comparison might be to the Event Horizon Telescope project, which relied on multiple teams who were all segregated from each other to evaluate the data, to make sure that their, the final image of the black hole was not a result of observer bias. So they, they literally duplicated the data, had it in four locations, sealed them off, and made sure they couldn't sort of have a consensus because of their desire to have a consensus. And even in their last representations of it, they were very scrupulous about saying, this is not a picture of a black hole. This is a consensus picture generated by multiple neural networks and multiple teams all overseeing each other's work to make sure we're not like just trying to invent something because we all really want it to happen. And that, to me, that is another example of this emergent information space that's so complicated and hard, but so beautiful and amazing. There's nothing like it since Newton and perspective. Like we're, our perspective as authors of our own citizenship and the, the, the idea of agency and control is, is utterly being transformed by this, this new visual landscape. Yep. Yeah, but like, like for me, I mean, like, I, I don't see the problem maybe um, on the scale of the universe. I mean, there, there are surely also things that could go uh, dramatically wrong uh, and, <laughs> that, and, and I'm sure that in 200 years, um, people will be like, oh my God, what, are, what have they, they been thinking about? But um, <laughs> Where, where it might become problematic is on the social and on the human scale. And there it becomes interesting when we talk about the terms uh, big data or data and, and the way also, I mean, this is especially uh, to you, Laszlo, how 
where, where do these data sets come from and what are they really represent? Mm, and, and that's where it becomes interesting to me and, and where also these platforms come or should be much more in focus uh, than, they, than they are recently. I mean, um, if, if I go to Facebook, for example, I mean, um, there, for, for a long time, there, there was only one gesture to make uh, or two, either you comment on a post or you like a post. Um, and the, the like is a, is a binary decision. And later on, they introduced uh, various other modes of representation that you can also um, also access uh, other things. But I think now they have like seven emotions, uh, which I would say it, uh, is not representative of, of the um, possible emotions I, I could have as a data source. But that this also came, came from some mm -hmm. uprisings um, mm -hmm. where people did not like uh, certain posts, uh, but they were still important. But these posts were basically neglected because they were not positive. There was, it was nothing that you liked. Um, mm. And I think a lot of what, uh, what this uh, data sources on the social domain um, are basically shaped by uh, the programs that are showcasing these things. And, and that is something that I would say is often neglected. Mm -hmm. Yep. I mean, it's interesting that you're saying uh, to ask where the data comes from, because I would say the early years of network science were defined by data that were never collected for the purpose of the network, but we were piggybacking on existing data sets to kind of discover networks. And only in the last few years, we people started to consciously go after the data collection process. And there is, of course, a big tradition in science of how you validate the data and how you validate your conclusions. But then this data escapes the science domain and becomes reality in a way that was never intended. And I think that's where the interesting questions that Wendy is asking again, uh, uh, come in as well, when it's used for purposes that were never intended for, even the criminal justice system, how it's using that software as you know, it tried to eliminate actually individual bias and create a systemic biases. And, uh, and, and I think those are the very interesting stories that show up uh, uh, in, in, in that kind of the, the interface of data, art and social responsibility. And also the awareness that the data was collected for a certain purposes the, the, uh, and now being used for another one. You said your maps don't really matter right now in the universe. Well, what if, what if 300 years from now, the extraterrestrials will feel like you misrepresented their position in the universe, right? <laughs> By showing it, and they do, you don't show them how connected they are to the other galaxies. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm just asking because we are already, the time is just running, it's crazy. So we have already um, so many questions from the audience. Um, I had so many more questions as well, but okay. <laughs> Should we open up? Please. What do you think? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, let's go to the first question we got from Douglas. So he wanted to ask, um, I would like to hear a few panelists discuss the most insightful or interesting data visualization you have seen recently. I'm delighted to start. I was at Art Basel and I saw a beautiful work by, I, I'm gonna butcher his name. I think he's Matthew Labardieu, who's a designer out of France, who has done a beautiful work of showing the age kind of distribution the, the, of each country as some beautiful vessels, right? And uh, even draw, I think it won the big price of Art Basel and, and that particular section. And, uh, and it was, one and it was personal because no matter what country you come from, and I have a deep connection to the US, Hungary and Romania, there was a personal narrative for me to see, right? But it was also taking out data out of context uh, in, a for, in a form that you would never expect to see them as kind of symmetrical vessels. I wish I would have the picture to show it to you. So, and I think there are, we see more and more of those type of situations where people really are insightfully kind of bringing data back to us 
in a way that surprise us and, and tell a story about the world. And it's much more than data viz. It is kind of where, where it turns from data visualization into art. Anybody else? Difficult. <laughs> There's too many visualizations around, I guess. So should we go to the next question or Matthew, did, did you say, want to say something? Oh, no, I just, I mean, I, I feel that the... I mean, at this point, you could also speak about your new project, I think, because we didn't come to that at all. Yeah, I have, to, I have too much bias. Too much, I got too much skin in the game to <laughs> <laughs> talk about <laughs> who's, well, who great. else is. We want to pin you down to that. So, <laughs> so you're working on steered gun processing, right? Yeah, well, I, I sort of feel like that the... the a great problem that the, the work of the Barabashi lab kind of problematizes is to what degree, and it goes back a little bit to um, Kim's question, is to what degree we start to venerate the images, the icons of data as themselves so compelling. And, and then if we find a resonance, so in the, like the Barabashi lab ones, I, I've sort of cited that paper, that 2008 paper, a thousand times as if it's like a, a religious text. And, you know, I'm like, and I show people the, I say, see, see, 7% of life is free, you know, and it becomes a kind of <laughs> morality tale that I'm telling about data and the universe. And so the degree to which we, um, I would just say the kind of resistance to the homogenization of data forms is really important, that they become hyper diverse and we be super vigilant because the software drives homogeneity in representation and then it shrinks people to points and that in itself is a point of view and if if we're little points inside a map of even bigger points and then we go down to atoms and, it, and we're all just being driven by the latest product from adobe that's where so that's where the steered gans are interesting to me because the gans are adversarial networks and they are designed to fight each other with if you can kind of fool them into fighting like two little species fighting over like a little scrap of food they don't really know what they're doing and they start to generate very wild sort of what to the lab would be bad results like the, the kind of pile of discards you'd be like well that that's horrible data it's not even data that's just confusing <laughs> but i think in that scrap pile you know the earth in terms of the the universe our planet is sort of and the, the extreme odd range of what is possible we're we're the outlier on that graph we're not a representation right we're there's not a lot of planets full of lots of people as far as we can tell there's just our weird messy gooey place so understanding that that's a that's a beautiful thing to think about in data visualization is like how do we represent the the sketch space that we dream in rather than the that concretized kantian correlative space where we, mm -hmm. where we're organizing. So I think, I think that's what fascinates me about this emergent space is there's so much to play for. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thanks. So um, we have also another question by um, Zach Feldman. Um, he said, a key motive in this discussion is the deep connection to data and capitalization and colonization. Perhaps it's a rhetorical question he says, but What does indigenous, indig indigenous data look like? It's a very interesting one, I um, think. I'm, I'm right now asking myself the same question. Uh, we started yeah. working with a, uh, uh, with a um, tribe in, um, in Canada, the Chubach. Um, and yeah, uh, I, I don't have an answer yet. Uh, maybe we can do another panel in two years and see. <laughs> <laughs> I figured something out, uh, but it, it's it's quite, kind of fascinating, like from the first things that I'm looking into, because a lot of their history is oral history, and they are telling a lot of um, the things, how, how they are doing things and how they are using things in stories, and it's a very different way, and I'm right now at a point where I'm not sure if, if, if this kind of knowledge can be actually stored in a database. Or if, if, if this is something that we can store this digital so westernized system, which systems, which I find truly um, 
intriguing and, and interesting to, to think and look into. And there's, of course, been a lot done around indigenous uh, data sovereignty. Um, and the ways in which they insist that the notion that everything can be open is, is wrong and that there are certain things um, that are, are marked because uh, so many things were considered to be open, um, they were exploited both in terms of their lands and DNA. And so there's been a lot of really interesting moves to think through what data sovereignty and what data ownership looks like. Um, and in New Zealand has been a great site for this and uh, they're actually building a data center that will be community owned um, as well as um, speaking to the communities. Um, there's also indigenous protocol on AI which is really fascinating um, and th thinking various ways of being kin with our machines rather than a certain master and slave relationship. Um, and so I think there's, there's many different uh, things that are emerging within this space. Okay, great. Interesting. So um, we have another question by Philip um, Pocock. He actually says, please speak about the role, if any, that pretty data visualization plays in subliminally encouraging, perhaps even gaslighting private data mining as a pretty picture. Is there such a side effect? I don't know. Any take, of you? take it, Wendy. Take it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think we could all speak to this one. Um, um, absolutely, yes. I think that uh, there are ways in which uh, the you know this is the problem of valorizing art in certain ways. As if all art speaks to and, and probes the visible and invisible in certain ways. I think that definitely there are data visualizations. Um, you can even think of the banal one of, of you and all your friends, right, that, that is offered to you constantly where you are at the center and therefore you can see everything else and it makes you feel empowered as if you are, are here. Um, and I think that this question of gaslighting though um, and these representations um, go just beyond what's actually shown to the very um, formation of these networks. Because I would argue that the biggest gaslighting that is part of these networks is homophily, is the notion that similarity breeds connection and it's only similarity that breeds connection. So if you think, Kim, what you were talking about, your nearest neighbor um, uh, and trying to think through clusters in terms of nearest neighbors because the idea there is what must what our neighbors have to be similar, right? This is this weird moment actually in which the social sciences have infiltrated now, you know, the presumptions of science because why is it? Like why, ha why and how has homophily, which was this concept that um, emerged as a possibility within a study, um, become so ingrained that we think neighbors should be similar? Um, and what does that mean given that all of Western ethics to a certain point was about neighbors being different and the, the importance of dealing with difference with neighbors. Um, so I think that the question of gaslighting goes far beyond the representation to some of the things that we accept as given. Okay, this again is the gift, the date, what is given to us. I, I think Laszlo will know these as you might well that the, the Marino sociograms from the 1930s in New York with the sort of original sociograms that mapped out playground relationships were, they're very beautiful diagrams, but they're actually a record of misery because most of them describe how playground groups exclude almost everyone, you know, the set of one winner and everyone else kind of loses. But then they became iconicized as the kind of almost like the beginning of social networks. And the notion that data visualization is as much a record of who is excluded as who is included is we really don't want to look at the painful side of the data very much. And there's no kind of visual representation in a Facebook map of like, who are all the people you got rid of from your network where you turned off, you don't want to see anymore, or, right? Like that's, We've, there's a sort of relentless positivism to this idea that the visualization, I think that's where art can be, because art is used to being creepy and weird and showing you the nightmare, as well as that. I think the Gans do it sort of inadvertently. It's one of the reasons I like them is they show what goes wrong with paintings, which is 90% of all paintings are kind of creepy. 
You said it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That's our responsibility as artists. <laughs> <laughs> they think they're wonderfully creepy. <laughs> yeah, well, it shows you, you know, if you go to the basement of the Met, they have in the storage racks all these old colonial paintings of sort of the original settlers. And they thought these pictures were the, the greatest portraits of all time. And it's these terrifying, stern, often kind of, you can see the vitamin deficiency in every part of them. <laughs> the skeletal structure's all warped. <laughs> They're an amazing record of a very dark chapter that the people themselves made, hoping to send it forward in time as some kind of record of their data, right? And, and now it's in this basement as this kind of reminder that nothing's ever quite so simple. And it was an accu accurate, accurate representation of what they were proud of and what they considered as reality, right? Yeah. Yeah, they were, they were trying to, to boast to the future. Okay, super. So just as I said it, because it just fits so perfectly well, um, Wendy Chun actually is publishing a new book um, it's called Discriminating Data, Correlation, Neighborhoods, and the New Politics of Recognition. Um, we already ordered it, <laughs> but it's not um, out yet. So um, just that you know, um, if you want to read more or to kind of critically engage better um, with data, then you should get this book. So I, I think we should sum up. Um, it was really nice. But in the end of this conversation, I would like you to answer again with short statements um, so we can take something home from this conversation. So actually I would like to, to know how we can form a critical approach towards data and its visualization and what we can learn from your data reflections and what we should consider when it comes to the designing of data. So um, if you're um, okay with it, we do it alphabetically again. Um, but this time, I think, Laszlo, you should definitely also say something. <laughs> okay, so Kim. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for me, or uh, when, uh, when I teach uh, data visualization, what often helps is going through the process, um, if the students themselves go through the process of starting from, from collecting data and then going through filtering and cleaning up data and... Um, then finding re visual re representations. And once you, once you do that, you realize how fraught and how difficult uh, the decisions are that are made on, on the way. And in the, um, especially in this, in this first phase where you, where you have to like say something is included and something is excluded, but this is going through in all the steps and especially in the visualization. Yeah, it's always, um, always a separation and always something that, uh, where you exclude something from something else um, and you, you split up and you say, this is the one thing, this is the other thing. Um, so going through this process and not starting in the middle somewhere, but really starting at the beginning is often uh, very helpful. Um, to to develop a critical perspective and and to relook and and rethink what it means what data means in our lives. Okay, Wendy. Oh, um, I think um, in order to go forward, what is really important is that we work across our disciplines and our boundaries, um, and we do so um, from the point of the weaknesses within our own disciplines. Um, because I think that what's so important is that um, as we go forward, we are driven by the same questions often. Um, but in order to answer them, we need each other. Um, and in order to realize how we need each other, we have to start from what's broken in our own approaches. Um, and so I think that working with um, understanding our own limitations and then reaching out to others because they think differently than us, um, but we care about the same questions, um, is a way forward to take on um, what we're facing and that we should always look a gift horse in the mouth. So. <laughs> Sorry, um, Laszlo, I, I jumped. Don't worry. It's your turn. Sure. So actually, you know, 
you know, there's a famous snows to cultures, right? Uh, that uh, that that we have we have two sub communities in the world who don't speak eye to eye. One of them is literate in technology, and the other one is more humanistic approach. I think what is interesting about this conversation and the fact that this is actually happening on the auspices of a museum is the fact that we arrived to a, to a moment in history where no one can be indifferent to data. And uh, so, so the two cultures will have to merge at a certain point because, uh, uh, because at the end, so deeply data affects our life. And being in a museum context, I think one of the big responsibilities is for the art and the humanist space to kind of start taking data on a face value and to start integrating into its own practice and things like that. And, you know, of course, we shouldn't throw out the, the, the baby with the bathwater in the sense that we, yes, we're very aware of, of how many limitations the data collection process, the data usage processes, the, the interpretation and so on. But data is here to stay. And I think this conversation is very useful because we bring these many perspectives together, we confront them and we allow actually for that understanding to go forward so that uh, to the benefit of both communities on, in the snow sense. So I'm really excited to be part of this. I think we have a fabulous panel today that really kind of helped us to kind of bring these many different perspectives. And I'm just hoping that what will come out of this is why we are in a museum space, right? Is that art will engage more and more in a creative and a critical fashion with the data and critical I mean in this sense, not necessarily negative, but rather engaging with it, being curious about it and building on it. Okay, so Matthew is left. I, I couldn't agree more with, with Laszlo and, and the other panelists. Um, the CP Snow, which is a very strange article, a, a time capsule of, it's sort of based on whether each group will able to learn the canonical works. Like, will a scientist ever know enough? You know, I've read Goethe and will, will the, the literary crowd ever really? And I think we're in an utterly different time now where the, that interpenetration has actually happened over the last 50 years. But we haven't really found a language to sort of deal with it. Now there's, there, instead of two lights with two sets of shadows, there's one light with one shadow where we're sharing, but that shadow space is, is what we haven't really wanted to think about. Well, but it's, I think it's so important to like begin those because it's, it's defining everything. Right, like that from Facebook to policing to ev everything is being defined. So how we represent that to ourselves is how we'll be able to create a culture, like not two cultures, but one culture that shares data. Otherwise we will have no culture, not, not two cultures, but no culture. So super grateful to have been here and to hear so much about, to be reminded of the importance of this is absolutely incredible. Thank you guys. Super, thank you all. This was a very, very nice conversation. And um, so for the audience, I just wanted to remind you that there's still um, two panels in the future um, as um, um, a program for the Barabashi Lab um, exhibition at ZKM. So at December, 2nd of December, we will have um, a conversation about art networks um, with Maximilian Schich, Mitali Banerier and uh, Viola Lukas and Laszlo, Albert Laszlo Barabashi. And on uh, January 6th, or maybe another date, it's not completely clear yet, yeah, we will have a conversation on communication networks and deep fakes. And the panelists are Martino um, Mauro, um, Carlo Ratti, and um, Heidi um, Torek. So um, looking forward to the next panels and thank you all for watching and see you next time. Thank you all. Thank you, dear, dear panelists. Thank you. <laughs>